السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ولي المؤمنين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله سيد ولد آدم أجمعين صلى عليه الله ما غرد الكمري على الأفانين وعلى آله وصحابته الغر الميامين وعلى تابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Welcome each and every single one of you back to Beacons of Light. This week, we're going to continue the story of Sauda radiallahu anha and derive some more benefits from her noble example, insha'Allah jalla jalal. Last week, we stopped just at the part where uh, Khawla radiallahu anha had um, put forward the proposal of, uh, or the, the prospect of Sauda to uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after he had lost his beloved Khadija radiallahu anha. And so uh, today we will pick up from there. So at this point, um, as we had mentioned last week, uh, Khawla, she had put forward the prospect of marriage to um, um, uh, Sauda. And in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked her, who can there be after Khadija? You can see how much he loved her. And so Khawla, she actually suggested two people, Aisha and Sauda, who age-wise, um, socioeconomically, uh, even, you know, personality-wise, could not be, you know, <laughs> further opposites on the spectrum. Aisha, of course, being the daughter of, of the most beloved uh, man to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his best friend Abu Bakr, and we'll talk about that more later. And then of course, uh, Sauda radiallahu anha, who had just lost her husband, she was older in age, she had her own children, um, but she also was someone who was in need. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, he understood that she was righteous, that she was someone who believed in Allah and, and uh, obeyed the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she was a virtuous Muslima. And so all those factors combined and also understanding the, the daughters that Khadija had left behind and needing an older role model and someone who could step in and fill that role. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sent a formal proposal. And of course, Sauda radiallahu anha, she was elated. So they actually uh, got married in Mecca. They got married in Mecca. And this marriage, it took place uh, about 10 years after Wahi uh, had came down. So this was, you know, in the thick of a lot of uh, turmoil and, and uh, unrest within that Meccan society, uh, the turmoil between the oppressors of Quraysh and the uh, Muslims, you know, and, and the need to even leave. It had gotten so bad that people were having to leave, right? And uh, as we discussed last week, um, Sauda was from those who had left to go to Abyssinia and actually came back. But of course the situation devolved so much that it eventually led to making hijrah to uh, Medina. And so um, that marriage, it actually took place about 10 years after Wahi. And about 10 years after Wahi, this is when we're in the midst of the year of sadness. This is when we're in the midst of, of that unrest. And uh, the marriage actually happened in uh, the month of Ramadan. Let's fix that. Right. So, so Sauda, she found relief from the difficulty that she was going through uh, and, and, you know, keep in mind, her husband, Sakran, he was a, he was a good man and he was her financial support and she was not someone who had come from money or come from wealth. And, but even though that was the case, you know, when, once she got married, she found the relief that she needed. She found the support that she needed, but she made it very, very clear that she wasn't marrying Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam merely out of loneliness or merely out of the desire to be with someone. Rather, she married the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, saying, "It is not a mar it's not marital matters that I care so much for. It's not the husband, the wife, the the romance, the love, and all of these things. These are not the things that I'm really into it for. But it is that I would like to be Muhammad's wife on the day of resurrection. So even you know, in the midst of marrying Khairul uh, Khalqillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the best of creation, the best of mankind, Sayyidu Waladi Adam." The, the master and the leader of all of the children of Adam, she's not even thinking about having him in this world. She's thinking about being with him uh, in the hereafter. So even her marriage 
was uh, something that she kept in mind for al-akhirah, for the hereafter. She's not even thinking about it merely for the dunya, even though it was something that became a relief for her in the dunya. She kept her eyes on the hereafter, even in such a situation. And so because of this, uh, she actually, because she wasn't really into like the marital matters and she wasn't really into the, uh, you know, the 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 day-to-day -day life of being married, she actually gave up a lot of her rights as a wife uh, by way of time and by way of resources to, uh, uh, with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, and she foregoed many of those rights uh, to Aisha, uh, you know, whenever he would later get married to her. To accommodate for the fact that, of course, she was, she was significantly younger, not just than, than Salda, but also significantly younger than uh, many of the wives of the Prophet them, right? So to accommodate her youthfulness uh, and her age, as well as her personality, we know Aisha radiallahu anha, she spent a great deal of time with the Prophet them. She's one of uh, seven uh, companions of Nabi Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we get many, many ahadith from. Uh, from. And the, the, a part of the reason why she narrated so many hadith is because she spent so much time with him, um, radiallahu anha. And so uh, from her personality and, and her mind and her intelligence, but also, uh, as we'll learn and, and see, from personality of, of Aisha radiallahu anha, she was also very, very protective and she had a very healthy, you know, we use the word jealousy and we sometimes use it in a, in a destructive way, in a negative way. But no, uh, there is uh, healthy jealousy and protectiveness and, and love for a person. And she had that very much so for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Selda, she under, understanding, first of all, now we're seeing, look, this emotional intelligence 101. She knows how Aisha is. She, she understands the situation. She's uh, using her empathy. She's using her sympathy. She's understanding all of the circumstances that are going into these things. And she's using that, she's using that altogether as a means of being considerate to Aisha. But this is just the way Selda was, radiallahu anha. She was very considerate. She was a considerate person. She was a giver. She was a doer. She was somebody who would go out of her way for another person. But even though that was the case, one of the most defining features about Selda, radiallahu anha, is her religiosity. She was so immersed in her religiosity that, that, uh, that, that not having the usual rights that a wife would expect in marriage, it did not bother her. She considered everything, uh, even the marriage to the Prophet Sallallahu it was a ibadah. You know, she's looking at everything through the lens of al-akhirah, of the hereafter. And so he, she was really immersed into religiosity while she was married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that continued even after his death, alayhi salatu wasalam. She never even made hajj and umrah on her own. After she made it with him, you know, she, she just considered it to be, look, I made, I made uh, Hajj and Umrah with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the one time he did it during his farewell pilgrimage when he established it and he did it with the Ummah. She said, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go after. She said, I went on Hajj and Umrah and now I will stay at home as my Lord says. And then she made a reference to a portion of an ayah, subhanAllah. You know, for us, uh, we, we live in a world where people, they were cherry pick ayat, they're cherry pick a hadith in order to make a point. Look at the part that she focuses in on from this ayah in Surah Al Ahzab, uh, chapter 33, verse number 33. And stay in your homes. It's just this portion of the ayah. She doesn't even take the, the rest of it. Stay quietly in your home. So she said, you know what? I'm following the statement of my Lord as a wife of the Prophet, وسلم, I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to go out after this. I'm, just, I'm not even going to make hajj after the farewell pilgrimage, just the last time and the only time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi made Hajj, that will suffice me. Now, uh, you know, we, we need to be mindful because sometimes we notice this with the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam today, we take very hyperbolic uh, responses to things that we see from the Sahaba, to Ahadith, to Ayat, to Ahkam, to rules in Islam, to uh, matters of fiqh, whether it be, uh, you know, a uh, matter of ikhtilaf or a matter of uh, or, you know, of difference of opinion or where we have some parity in the religion, uh, where you have choices that you can make. We see that there's oftentimes very hyperbolic responses, very, very extreme responses to how we perceive and, and interpret and follow uh, many of these things. So uh, it's important to note, Salda was not making Hajj Haram on herself. Okay, it's not, it's not a hyperbolic thing. She's not, she's not uh, you know, taking her worldview and she's not forcing it on anyone else. It's just a testament to the way that she perceived 
the things that were happening in her life and how she actualized that within her religious identity. And so despite her religiosity and devotion, because you, you, you read these things and you think, man, this, is, this woman, Radila Anha, she's very, very serious. Now, despite all of this, she was actually, uh, you know, the, she was known to be deeply religious. This is a, a defining factor that people knew her as. This is how Aisha Radilanha described her. This is how Um Salama described her. This is how the companions uh, Radilanha, whom this is how they knew her to be deeply religious. But even though that's the case, she was actually very, very jovial, meaning she had a very pleasant and happy disposition, and she was quick witted. She was funny. Her physical description is that of having darker skin, right? Uh, to actually of being black skinned. You know, this is how she's described as being like black in complexion. And uh, as being heavy set, she, she was a heavy set woman. And some of the uh, commentators on, on the reason for this description, because Aisha is the one who actually described her, and as being slow moving, was also to note that the Prophet them, he did not marry her out of physical desire or anything like this. He married her for, you know, both the practical, uh, the religious, the spiritual reasons for uh, marrying someone in such a situation. And that's going to be a continued theme. I mean, the, the focus of, these, uh, of this talk is not necessarily about the marital side of his relationship, Salah uh, with his wives, Radiallahu Anhu Hun, but um, it's important to note that, uh, how she was as a person. You know, the image of beauty and the image of funny and the image of, of a charismatic and the image of wit and the image of, of uh, you know, being uh, someone who is impactful or even the image of influencers is today, uh, in, in today's society is very different. Super skinny uh, translates to super beautiful. Super fair skin translates to, to super beautiful. Oftentimes, uh, most humor is predicated, uh, most humor in today's world is at the expense of another person. Most humor in today's world is at the expense of a group of people. Most humor in today's world is, is, is uh, through being lewd and being crass and being, uh, you know, vulgar. But um, no, this is not uh, the image of beauty. This is not the image of humor. This is not the image of influence or the image of popularity. Rather, for us as, um, as, as, as Muslims, we know that the contents of the heart are much greater. And so uh, a testament to her, her humor and her wit and the way that she was, Radhiallahu Anha, is that she could even make the Prophet Sallallahu them laugh when he was down. You know, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, is known to, to smile. But there were moments in time. This is a man, alayhi salatu wasalam, who had seen heaven and hell. This is a man, alayhi salatu wasalam, who was tasked with, with, uh, with, with being the final messenger of Allah, the, the wahi, the revelation he received that was heavy. The difficulties and, and, and things that he had witnessed in his life were, were very uh, hard. And so sometimes the Prophet, وسلم, even Abu Bakr, looking at Rasulullah, he said, you become gray, you become gray. Uh, like noting that his beard was graying, that he was aging, that he looked old, and when, when he was asking why, was it the battle of Uhud that made him turn gray? Was it the uh, trial of Ta'if that made him turn gray? Was it the years of systematic oppression in, uh, from the chieftains of Quraysh uh, and, and uh, their, their community of mushrikeen, of, of those who associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was that what made him turn gray? He said, no, that's not what made him turn gray. It was actually Surat uh, al-Hud and uh, uh, her sisters, meaning the, the other chapters of the Quran that uh, are in uh, line with those heavy messages that you see in Hud, which uh, from memory, I believe is, um, it is uh, uh, Surat al-Hud, Surat al-Takwir, um, uh, Imfitar, uh, and Neba. I believe it's those uh, three. So those four surah all together, that made the Prophet them gray. So you can see that this is a person who is dealing with a, a, a lot, you know, to, to, to try to even perceive the psychological disposition of Rasulullah would be its own task in and of itself with everything that he went through. But Sauda was able to even make him laugh, you know, in spite of all of these factors. Once he was very, very sad and he was distraught and he was pale faced, he was distressed. And so because of that, as the Prophet them often would, whenever there was a difficult situation, he would go look for the solution in prayer. He would go look for the solution in salah. And so uh, in that difficult time and in that difficult circumstance, he led the prayer and he led the prayer. It was a very long prayer. And a part of the, 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 the feature of this very long prayer was that he made very, very long, long uh, sajda. 
He was in prostration for a long period of time. And so she told the Prophet Sallallahu the next day, now keep in mind, look, look at the emotional intelligence. She's not going to go right up to him after a long emotional prayer and a stressful day and all of these difficult things happening. Now look at the emotional intelligence. She comes to him the next day and she said, I prayed behind you yesterday and the sajda was so long that I felt my nose was about to bleed. Just poking fun at him, just, just you know, saying, uh, you know, something just to put a smile on his face. And when she said that to him, he laughed so much that his molars were visible and that gloomy face that he was carrying out, والسلام, it faded away. And so beyond her religious devotion, she was extremely generous. This is another description that Aisha anha, uh, gave of her. And you can see that from her noble example, she had a significant impact on uh, Aisha with the way that she described her. Um, she wasn't just very, very religious. She wasn't just very, very devout. She was also extremely generous. And she lived a very long life. She lived actually until the Khalifa of Umar ibn al-Khattab and she died around the age of 90, radiallahu anha. So a few things to note, some reflections to take from this. Let me just uh, finish that moment. So a few reflections to take from this. The most religious are the most considerate of others. Sauda radiallahu that one of the main things that you're going to see time and time and time again from this beacon of light, that our mother, radiallahu anha, is yes, yes, she was very religious, but she was also extremely considerate. Her emotional intelligence is through the roof. She's uh, looking at Aisha and understanding who she is, and she's accommodating her. She's seeing how the Prophet wasallam is, and she's there for him. She's able to put a smile on his face. She's a giver. She's someone going out of her way for others. So a religious person should not be someone who is, con who is inconsiderate or apathetic or detached or desensitized or numb or, or like has a, rock, uh, that's the, uh, has a rock for a heart and doesn't ever smile and doesn't ever, you know, do uh, things to make other people smile or to, to uh, make other people feel good. In fact, the more religious you are, the more considerate you should be of others. And this can be a personal litmus test for each and every single one of us. Yes, uh, you know, sometimes people will, will like, it's, it's kind of like two extremes. One is, I'm not very religious, and I don't care. And, you know, that apathy, uh, or that lack of care for others, that inconsiderate, uh, you know, disposition, and that stony face, and, you know, hard eyebrow and stuff. Is like, I'm not really, I don't care. And you, you, you manifest that in your treatment of others, because you consider yourself to not be religious. No. Anyone who believes in Allah on the last day is someone who has to be religious. It's not, uh, if, you, if you are spiritual, then you can only be spiritual as a Muslim by doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Prophet them said. How else can you tap into spirituality, is spirituality doing something other than Islam? And how would you know Islam except by doing what the Quran and the Sunnah uh, tell you about it and how the scholars explained it. And so even if you do something in this deen, that means that you are practicing the religion. And the fruit of your ibadah, of your worship, should make itself evident in the consideration of others. And then you have the other extreme of people who are so religious that you can't have a conversation with them. You can't uh, talk to them. You can't connect with them. Uh, it feels like they're, they're practicing Islam from an ivory tower and you just can't reach them. No, there is not a single human being on the face of the planet that was more religious than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he is our example, not anyone else. Like if, if you are following the example of another person, it's only because they connect you to his example Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We never stop our connection with him and another person. So if you find, uh, you know, someone being religious, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the most religious person on the face of the planet. And he was the most accessible, the most, uh, he was the one who would smile. He was the one that was there for others. He was the one that was considerate. And this example is made even more evident in the noble example of our mother Sauda, radiallahu anha. Again, religious, as is devout. These are descriptions that you hear time and time again, but consider it. Religiosity should make itself evident and consider it in consideration and empathy for others. Devotion should never negate humor and happiness. Sometimes we think that the more religious a person should be, the more uh, stone-faced and unsmiling and, and unhappy they should be. No, 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 no. Submitting to Allah should be the one thing that makes you happier than anything else on the face of the planet. How can a person who knows that they're putting their face on the ground and worshiping our Rabb, the Most High, our Lord, the Most High, how can this person come out of a prayer and not be smiling and not be happy? How can a person who knows the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was someone who 
had a clever wit. He was very funny. He was uh, someone who, you know, can make people feel uh, good and make them feel happy. Uh, and, and he had a time for seriousness and he had a time for, uh, you know, lightheartedness. He had a time uh, that encouraged, you know, seriousness from the people around him. He had a time that encouraged, uh, you know, lightheartedness in the people around him. And uh, our mother, Saudi radiallahu anha, and, and seeing him down and seeing him distressed, she's able to put a smile on his face. It doesn't matter how devout you are as a person or how undevout you consider yourself to be or whatever have you. No, no, no. Anyone who believes in the law in the last day, you should, you should uh, be someone who emanates happiness. It emanates clean humor. You know, sometimes uh, we laugh so much that it hardens our hearts. Um, sometimes we, we focus on trying to find so many funny things and lighthearted things that we don't know when it's time to be serious. Rather, Islam teaches us to be balanced in all of our affairs. And last but not least, the reflection that we take from this shining light, radiallahu anha, is the contents of the heart are greater than the physical appearance. You know, um, and due to the uh, sociological conditioning, uh, whether it be through colonization or whether it be through years of, of, of systematic oppression, our understanding of what is beautiful, of what is uh, courageous, of what is uh, masculine of what is feminine or even in today's age where those lines are even being blurred and crossed with one another all uh, under the pretense of enlightenment or all under the pretense of understanding but really under the pretense of pushing an agenda that may not necessarily be in the best interest of the people who uh, further it themselves no 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 the physical appearance of a person is not what makes them noble you know beauty is truly only skin deep but rather beauty makes itself evident in the personality of a, of a person of and the um speech of a person and how they connect with someone so if a person has a pure heart regardless of how they look that purity will shine through in what they say and what they do and on the other hand you may find some people whose uh, speech it, it sounds good to you they're eloquent they're well spoken they're well liked they have, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers on social media, subscribers on YouTube. When they talk, uh, you know, it, it appeals to you. Um, or, or they're beautiful. Their physical appearance is, 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 you know, something that many people do not have. But oftentimes these people who have, uh, you know, the eloquent speech and the, and the uh, you know, appealing physical appearance are sometimes some uh, people who, who also their chest harbors the darkest hearts. So we never ever uh, heuristically assume that just because a person is, is uh, you know, beautiful or well-liked or popular or, or whatever have you, that this is a testament to what is in the heart because their actions and their speech will uh, actually make that even more clear. And we never assume just because a person is dark-skinned or a different nationality or, you know, even poor or downtrodden or not uh, someone with any, uh, you know, status or anything like that. They're not a doctor. They're not an engineer. They don't have this type of house. They don't drive this type of car. Oh, they're just, uh, you know, they're just a chef. You know, we live in a, in a society and we, we see cultures that think that being a, a person of Islam is like the lowest rung of society, but being a doctor or an engineer is the highest the height that a person can reach in terms of status and success. No, rather, the highest uh, status and success that we can reach is being loved in the, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that, was only, that is only attained by having a qalb as salim, a pure heart. And the only way to do that is by adhering to what Allah is pleased with and following the sunnah of His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, uh, bearing all of that in mind, uh, we've concluded uh, looking at the noble light of our mother, um, Sauda, radiallahu anha. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to facilitate khair upon khair uh, for your upcoming week. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep each and every single one of you safe from harm in all of its forms. We ask Allah to keep you all safe from COVID. We ask Allah to keep your, your loved ones safe from COVID. We ask Allah to keep you all safe from what is worse than it and what is less than it. We ask Allah to increase each and every single one of you in good. We ask Allah to allow for us to embody the light that, uh, the light from the noble example of our mother Khadija radiallahu anha and now our mother Sauda radiallahu anha and to give us the tawfiq and the success to take from the light of the noble examples of the rest of our mothers radiallahu anhum. Allahumma ameen ya rabbal arsh al-kareem. Kuritum wa juzitum wa muqitum wa kufitum wa ani shaytani nuhitum. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatuhu. Well,